So we've been studying Colossians. Tonight we're going to look at uh, verses 5 through 8. And uh, we've gotten to the last section here. So the introduction, that was the first 14 verses. Then we took, went to the theology. That's, you know, what, what to believe about Jesus specifically. And uh, then kind of he takes us into the ethics, which is kind of like, okay, so what do you do with this knowledge of, of God? And uh, so we see kind of, you know, um, the, the transition here between, you know, the introductory issues to the beliefs to the lifestyle. And ethics, that's all that it is. It's, it's how to live. So it's how to live what you believe. You believe these things, that's great. How does that fit in? For a lot of us, we don't really even think about that. We just kind of have our beliefs and then our day-to-day -day life, and we kind of keep the two separate as much as possible. And Paul is showing that not only shouldn't you do that, but it's kind of impossible to do that. So that takes us to, to the breakdown here. Last week, we looked at um, thank holy. And tonight, we're going to look at act holy. And uh, when I wrote that, I realized that there must be a different, a better way to say that because it makes it sound like you're pretending I'm acting. <laughs> and that's not how I mean it. I mean, I don't really think that that's how Paul means it. So that's how we're going to look at it. And, and if you followed um, the breakdown that we've, that we've done so far, you see a natural flow to the argument in Colossians. It starts like this. Your beliefs affect your thoughts. That's how he starts out. Okay, this is who Jesus actually is. And then he kind of starts to tie it in to what they're thinking about. That's what we looked at last week. But now tonight, we're going to go from last week we were talking about thinking holy. So your, 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 your thoughts, they lead to your actions. They're all connected. So the things that you believe will inevitably affect your thoughts. The things that you think, they lead to your actions, whatever they are. The problem is that we typically look at ourselves as a very surface level. Okay, So not only do we see ourselves as a hero in any given situation, but we also tend to kind of look at it and kind of think, I'm a whatever kind of person, uh, usually a positive trait. I'm a caring person or something like that. And we never really get into the heart of who we are. And I think that's why it's very important and essential that we go through great struggles in life, because our struggles show us what's actually in there that we hide from ourselves. We are master manipulators of ourselves. We make ourselves think that we're good people, that we don't need God, that we got our things together, or we make ourselves believe that we're such a screw-up, God can never use us. Either way, it's all about us. You can take it in a good way or a bad way, but we always make it all about us. And uh, that, that's one of the things that, that Paul's definitely showing us. And so what are actions? Well, I, 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 need, I need to define what actions are because uh, a lot of times when we say actions, we only think about our physical actions. Um, so, like, uh, I walked on the stage, you know, I read my children a, a nighttime story. These are actions that we think of. But actions, especially in the context of Colossians, is a lot more than just the things that you do with, like, your arms and your legs. Um, they can be physical, they can be emotional actions, or they can be psychological or mental actions. So here's three examples of each. When you're looking at porn, that would be a physical action that you are doing. When you are lusting in your heart, whoa, she's hot. That would be any, an emotional action that you're doing. You're not actually doing anything. You're standing there. I'm not doing anything. But it's still an action because you are still doing something. <laughs> and then the last one, thinking about porn. So this is more of a psychological thing. It's, it's more of a mental thing. We, we, don't all, we only, only act based on our, our emotions or our physical body. We often do things in our mind too, don't we? That would be the, the third thing there. So actions, if I had to define them, they'd be more like things you do and things you choose to, things you choose. So whether, it th whether, it, whether it's things that you choose to feel or think about or do, they're all actions. So a good example of this would be you notice someone, you're attracted to them, this is a natural thing, but then you dwell on that and you are, you are acting. That action is lust. Um, you have a moment of doubt. Those come, everybody has them. But then you choose to dwell on that until you get into the realm of disbelief. That would be an action. So even though you're, you can disbelief without, you can go to the realm of disbelieving God, disbelieving God without actually walking somewhere, you are still doing an action. So that takes us to the section here itself. And so keep in mind, we're talking about from, from beliefs to thoughts to actions, and actions are not simply things you do with your arms and legs, okay? So, therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, Okay, he's going to talk about putting to death the actions. Look at this. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust. Not something you do necessarily with your arms and legs. See? Evil desires, once again, <laughs> when we think of actions, we think only physical. I went for a run today. See what I mean? 
uh, and greed, which is idolatry. So he's saying greed, an emotional thing, is idolatry, a physical thing. You get, the, you get what he's saying here? He's saying there, there is a connection here. Your actions are not just the things you physically do. It's also the things you emotionally do and the things you mentally do, right? Okay, so because of these, God's wrath is coming from the, the disobedient. Now, he's not talking about just this list here. Like as long as you don't do that list, that specific list, God's wrath is not poured out on you. No, 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 no. And we'll talk about this in just a minute. He's talking about these kinds of things. Because of these kinds of things, um, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. And that's all we're going to look at tonight. Okay? So let's get started on the verse 5. It says this, Therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality. That's the first thing. The second thing is impurity. The third is lust. Fourth is evil desire. And greed is the last thing. And then he says, this is idolatry. So remember the argument from last week. We have died to Christ, right? When we got saved, we die, not to Christ, died to self. Uh, last week we were talking about the way that when we got saved, when we chose to follow Christ, we died to ourself, right? We looked at that last week. So therefore, put to death what belongs to your earthly nature. See what he's saying here? So let me say it like this. We have died with Christ when we got saved, but we still have to choose to die daily. That kind of makes sense? It's one of those things where it's an inner struggle. It's like this. Are you saved or are you not saved? Well, yes, I am saved. But does that mean for sure that you will be in heaven? Well, no, not necessarily, because although God will never leave you or abandon you, you can still leave and abandon God. So while we have in this, in, in this life, there is still the possibility of entering into his rest or not entering into his rest. So we can never really say that we're completely saved until we're in heaven. It, it's this idea that Paul talks about quite a lot. It's called the already but not yet principle. We are saved, but we're not saved. And what he means by that is we are saved in the here and now, but we don't have our final eternal salvation. Kind of make sense? So we have died, but we are still in the process of dying. Um, now, this list is not an exhaustive list. Uh, it shows the types of things. So like, for instance, on here, you're not going to see anything about, um, let me think of something real quick, uh, murdering somebody. You don't see anything on there about murdering something. And keep in mind that murder oftentimes comes from lust or evil desire or greed. But still, you get what I'm saying. So let's look at these things individual, individually. The, the first two things, I'm kind of grouping them together. He calls them um, sexual immorality and impurity. And they're, they're kind of real similar, so I kind of put them together. Um, sexual immorality is kind of like um, sex with prostitutes, uh, adultery, um, that kind of realm of, of things. But impurity is more of, um, more of like a broad term that doesn't have a specific translation. So you could think of it more as um, a sexual sin, generally speaking. So I've written down a couple examples to help you kind of understand what this is. Maybe sex with strangers, like a one-night stand kind of thing. Um, maybe uh, oral sex. Uh, I know a lot of teenagers think, oh, it's not really sex because there's no actual penetration going on, but scientifically speaking, it is. <laughs> and uh, definitely from a biblical perspective, it is. So um, there's that. Uh, so th th there's that. Sex with prostitutes, adultery, sexual sins. Okay. Any questions on that one? Pretty simple. So that takes us to the second one. Or I guess you could say the third one. It's second because we grouped the first two. But uh, the third one, which is lust. Uh, lust... A lust is kind of a hard thing to define because it can oftentimes be not just a sexual thing. It usually implies something sexual, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. And that's one of the things that separates lust from greed. You know, greed is more lust generally, and lust is more greed sexually. That kind of makes, makes sense to you. So lust would be like unbridled sexual urges, Okay. So um, I think, therefore I do. And this is real big in the culture today. Um, you know, if I have sexual confusion, we just put the title of this as, as transgender and we'll just start cutting pieces off my body. That would be a good example of, of you know, unbridled sexual urges, not really having any, any boundaries, any idea, any clarity. It's just kind of like something that you just, you know, whatever I feel, basically. And uh, you hear people say this a lot with, um, I, a couple years ago this was real big. You don't hear it too much now. 
and I, at least I don't, but uh, love is love. You hear people say this all the time. If love is love, that means all sexual boundaries do not exist, which means sex with children is not wrong. See what I mean? You can't, you can't say an absolute statement if it's not absolute. Um, so then you're saying, okay, so love is not love. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. Lust is unbridled sexual uh, urges. People make, the mistake of, people make this mistake of thinking that their lust is who they are. So a good example of this is, I'm attracted to the same sex, therefore I'm gay, therefore it's okay. We are born in sin. The Bible tells us this. Sometimes that sin is a sexual sin that we were born into. Like, for instance, homosexuality. Yes, some people are born gay. Yes, that doesn't mean it's an excuse to do the thing. Does that make sense? I'll give you another example. Sometimes people are tempted to do sexual things with children. That doesn't mean that they should do sexual things with children. Make sense? And the Bible kind of defines it just like that. The, the argument of whether you're born as a gay or not is it's something that the Bible doesn't even refute. It, it does, never makes the argument. All it says is, no longer live in your sin. That's what it says. And so for a long time, we've just been kind of arguing the wrong argument. That's just who I am. No, 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 no. That's the sin that you struggle with. It's not who you are. You're more than your sin. You're more than your sexual orientation. You're more than all those things. And uh, so lust would be unbridled, unbridled sexual uh, urges. Uh, a strong desire for is a more general term of that. And so that takes us to, I believe, the, no, not the last one, the second to last one, I believe. Uh, evil desires. Now, this this is, once again, more of a general term, and it segues from him talking specifically about sexual things to other sins. And I've been in the church for a long time. Oftentimes, there's certain sins that are kind of highlighted, like homosexuality, that's like a big one. That's like a big no. And then there's like, you know, other things. But then when you're a Christian, the, it, we ha kind of have this temptation to see, I'm all good. So I, can, I, I I'm all good. Everything's fine. So we, we let other sins go. It's the sin of arrogance and pride, right? That's No, that's not a big deal because at least I'm not gay. Um, the sin of adultery, oh, that's a big one. Well, um, you're looking at porn. Like <laughs> That is, I mean, still at least in the same area of the woods. I don't know if it's exactly, I don't, I don't know. Like that's up for debate, whatever. But it's got to be pretty close in the woods. You know what I mean? Like let's say it would be the difference between La Luz and Alamorosa, like they're so close together. <laughs> I don't even know if you can really draw a line too well. Um, so it's more of a more of a general term, um, not just talking about sex things and it kind of segues in there. So not just things like homosexuality, but also things like porn. Another good example of an evil desire would be hatred. Somebody does something and I want to see them suffer. I want to see them hurt. Hatred. Um, and that kind of kind of summarizes it up pretty well. And then he ends off the list with with greed, which is something that we don't really talk about too much um, in modern society because it's kind of okay now um, in, in our society. I don't mean God thinks it's okay. I mean, we kind of see it as okay. Greed just like really not that big of a deal. Like I, as long as I'm, you know, being a good dad and, and a good husband and I'm going to work and, you know, I've got a steady income. I mean, it's kind of okay, it's kind of okay if I... Uh, you know, if I want to hold on to my things, it's my life. Well, I tell you what we're real greedy with is we're real greedy with our lives. Uh, more so than money, we're greedy with our lives. We would do pretty much anything to find peace for ourselves. But oftentimes we wouldn't do this go to the same measures to find peace for somebody else. Greed, it's something we all struggle with. We all having, have it living inside of us, but we don't really ever talk about it. Because once again, it's okay. I'm a Christian, so it's okay for me to greedy, be greedy because it's not something that's out there. Like I give in tithes and offering, get off my back. You know what I mean? And um, so it's just one of those things. It's also kind of called covetousness or, or coveting in some Bibles. Kind of an outdated word there. But if you are old enough to remember that word, they both basically mean the exact same thing. It's when you are coveting, you are desiring something. It's the idea that I have to have more. And uh, it is the foundation of being discontent in life. Um, it's, you know, I, I'm not content with what I have. I, I need more. And so how in the world does this become idolatry? Well, the thing is, um, idolatry isn't something, once again, that any of us actually use by its name, but we all practice it. Um, idolatry would be um, something you are seeking worshiping not necessarily with songs but like with your life your life is all about it so for instance some people have really nice sports cars and you could say that they worship it in the sense that it's all they ever think about can it make sense 
Um, so it's something you're seeking, worshiping, something you're greatly desiring for. So that which you seek, worship, or desire, that is idolatry. And it doesn't have to be an idol that you have in your house. It, it, idolatry can really be anything. And, and Paul specifically here ties it to greed. Greed is idolatry. And um, so the thing about these things is they're opposed to Christ, the nature of Christ, the character of Christ. And, um, and it causes us to not be content in life and to not have sound thought. You know, it kind of causes us to get let off. So that leads us to the verse 6. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. Once again, these types of things, um, not these specific five things. Um, so people people are slaves to sin. And, and, I, and I sometimes hear um, a lot of people making fun of, like, transgenders and LGBTQ. And I don't really think that that's the smartest thing that we've ever done. Uh, you know, I understand being politically upset, being upset with the state of the nation, being upset with different things like that. But remember, um, making fun of an audience really isn't the best way to witness to them. Obviously, people who are stuck in transgender and that kind of stuff, they're not mentally stable. I mean, it, whenever you get to a place of saying, you know, wrong is right, black is white, like it's just you know, whatever nonsense I, I, I come up with in my mind, you have to just affirm me in that. Obviously, you're talking about somebody who's really stuck in sin. You know what I mean? It's completely warped their sense of uh, life. You know, and so I, I'm not quite sure that making fun of them would be the best course of action. Kind of one of those things, shooting ourselves in the foot. Maybe a better course of action would be to listen, pray for, befriend, these kinds of things. Um, because, once again, it, it's something where that's what it means to be slaves to sin. You're stuck in a sin. You're not mentally stable. You're not mentally mature. Or you're not spiritually mature. You're, you're stuck in a sin. And uh, so, you know, because of these, God's wrath is coming upon uh, the disobedient. People are slaves to sin, and God's wrath will bring punishment on those who don't submit to him. God's wrath will bring punishment. So there's kind of a lot of ideas out there that God's not really going to punish people. Everybody was going to be saved. And you read verses like this, and it's absolutely clear. Because of these, God's wrath is coming upon the disobedient. Not, not was about to come, and then Jesus died. Is coming on. See, there, there's a difference there. It's not that we can just ignore things because Jesus came, right? And so there is definitely still a moral standard uh, to the world. And uh, so this is something that applies to Christians and non-Christians alike. Everybody knows that God's wrath is going to come on non-Christians, but they think it's not going to come on me. But if you look at all, the grand majority of the prophets in the Old Testament, most of those prophets prophesied to people who were actually God's people. So if you think about that, and you kind of translate that to nowadays, that would be another way of saying that would be most of the prophets weren't for the world, they were for the church. That would be another way of saying that. Um, if you read in the book of Revelation, uh, where he's talking about the seven churches and the spirits of the churches and stuff, he's talking about Christians, not, not, not people out there in the world. And he says, I will vomit you out, talking about a Christian church, not, not the world. So, I mean, once again, it, it's well to kind of look at these things with humility instead of saying, these gays are ruining our society, these transgenders are just, uh, you know, you know, if something irritates you that bad, maybe don't watch the news and don't watch things that are, are making you feel more upset. For this reason, I actually don't watch things like Fox or CNN be, because I don't want to get riled up. You know what I mean? I already know what bothers me, and I don't need somebody else constantly ranting about something that bothers me. I mean, like some of it's in, some of it's interesting. Like Matt Walsh did that documentary about what is a woman. Okay, so that's, that would be educational, kind of make, makes sense. But remember, if you start getting irritated about it, maybe turn it off until later you know um I, there's a lot of people that i don't even watch uh, one is uh some like crowder or steven crowder i think is his name uh, i don't watch him because he whenever he starts talking i think about all the things that are irritating me then i'm in a bad mood and it's like yeah i, I already know that the culture is evil i already know we need jesus i don't need somebody telling me about how terrible the situation is i'm already upset it's like if you're if you're worried about your finances you probably shouldn't be sitting there all day reloading your your um your bank account online you know what I mean? Like maybe go get a job and, and turn off the bank account for a little bit and try to stop spending as much as possible and take it from there. Um, so, okay, we always think about how it's coming on the non-Christians, but we don't think about how God's wrath comes on Christians too. On Christians too. Uh, in my life, I've seen some some Christians, they, they didn't they didn't leave the faith, but they got involved in sins that, that brought different physical curses on their life. I've seen that with my life and with my eyes. Um, I've experienced in my own life 
It's not something that, you know, I think, oh, well, this or that. It's one of those things. It's like, yeah, that that that's something that happened. I remember one time God told me to say something, and I lied about what he told me to say. And because uh, I, I didn't want to. I, I wanted to. Well, I had my own reasons. That's good enough. We always have our own reasons. And, uh, you know, it, uh, you know, then, then God obviously got upset with me for it because I didn't do what he told me to do. So we, we think of these things, oh, God's wrath on them. They're the sinners. But let's check our own attitude, too, because we can definitely be into that same category. Uh, verse 7 says this, And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. So we were walking in them. So that's something we did. Okay, let's follow what he's saying here. So that's where we came from before we were saved. And, and here's the thing. It's where we are tempted to be again. Because remember, he's writing this for a reason. He's not just filling up space on a page. He's talking about something that they have gone through and are still going through. Hold on. I thought that if someone was saved, they were free from sin. They were no longer bound to sin. We'll get to that. Hold on. Hold on. Hold your horses. That takes us to verse 8, which answers that question. But now, put away all the following. But I thought we already had them put away. See, but now tells us this is actually a process. They are doing it more as they grow more. When you first get saved, you see these big glaring things. And then you struggle over those for years. And then you, you get victory over one of those things. And you think, I'm all good now. And we reach this place in our, in our spiritual walk where it's kind of like just a place of, of arrogance. And, you know, we know everything. You can't teach me anything. Uh, you know, and, and I already shared with you a couple weeks ago um, my list of things that I asked myself. So one of those things that I mentioned uh, that I asked myself quite frequently is, who's the more spiritual one in, in my marriage? Is it me or my wife? That right there tells me where I am, because whenever I am getting off with God, I'm always the more spiritual one. See what I mean? I see myself as I'm the more spiritual one. But then when I get closer to God, I see Gracie's value. See how that works? And this works for anybody, really. I, I've noticed and I've done a lot of counseling with people, and I noticed that this is kind of a recurring theme. Uh, when you start looking down on other people, it's a sure sign that you're not as close to God as you thought you were. Um, and it's just you know one of those real quick, easy ways to to do it. Um, sometimes we look down on pastors. Sometimes we look down on other people in the church or in the community or whatever. Uh, whenever you have that kind of prideful and arrogant spirit, uh, it's one of those things that you're just setting yourself up for a fall. Proverbs says it like this, uh, that pride actually comes before the fall. So if you are in a place of pride, you're going to have a fall. Um, I, I've seen time and time again, people, you know, rant and rave about transgenders and then they're caught in some kind of a sexual sin like pornography. I, I know one pastor who used to go on and on and on and on and on about how people need to do that. Never, ever, ever drink alcohol. And it was good things he was saying. But then he was a very large man because he had zero self-control with food. So he was telling them, you need to control your lust, but I'm not going to control my lust. You get what I'm saying? And it's the same thing we do in every area of your life. When you find yourself being real judgmental on any group of people, it's a sure red flag that you need to get your act back together with God. So this is a process. But now put away the following. Well, wasn't this supposed to have already happened? Well, yes, but it is still happening. It's like that already saved but not saved. So our life is different, but also we are still sinning. <laughs> it's also a little bit the same. Well, you know, we are free from sin, but we are still sinning. You know what I mean? It's one of those things where already, yes, but not quite yet. So uh, the emphasis here has changed. If you've noticed uh, previously, let me just read this real quick. Okay, previously, the, the, the list that he gave before, he gave us mostly sexual things and things involving ourself, right? Like impurity. That was more about something to do with me. But now he, now he switches the focus, and now he's going to talk about destructive habits in relationships. So now he's not talking about me and, and the sexual things I'm going through. Now he's talking about interrelational, okay, between me and somebody else. And uh, that, that takes us, he gives us a list here, and it's very difficult to separate these things. Now, put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice. Now, what in the world is different from anger, wrath, and malice? Slander and filthy language, which, once again, that kind of seems like a bit of redundancy again in our thinking. Uh, and uh, from your mouth. See, the thing is, I've noticed this, this recurring thing. Whenever, especially a Christian is stuck in a sin, they find as many loopholes as possible to make themselves all good. You don't know how many times I've seen somebody with a really, really bad attitude that they 
they have a way of twisting scripture and bending backwards. And if you guys have ever seen the matrix, the part where he's dodging the bullet, that's exactly uh, what Christians as Christians have the biggest problem with the Bible will have us dead to rights about something we need to stop doing. But instead of just being honest and saying, yeah, I am doing that. I need to stop doing that. Please forgive me. And then apologizing to people. Instead we do this. Oh, well, you know, they know my heart. And we just kind of go along our merry way. <laughs> it's like, well, you know, that's not really, not really. So, so Paul literally attacks this from every possible anger. And there is a slight difference between the things that he's mentioning. And let, let me show you them. I call this the vague list because they all sound so similar. So the first thing he says is anger. This should be, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a couple terms here. Mad, okay? I'm going to walk up and kick you in the shins. You're going to get mad, okay? So that feeling of mad over a long period of time, continual and mad, would be anger. Does that make sense? Whereas wrath is not mad over long periods of time. It is a sudden lash out. Make sense? So somebody does something that you don't like. Ugh! Think of road rage. Road rage would be wrath. <laughs> you woke up maybe in a great mood, and then you started driving, and now you're not in a good mood. That would be a good example. Uh, you were totally fine until you tripped over your spouse's shoes, and now you're not. <laughs> wrath. <laughs> That's different from anger. And then it takes us to malice. Now, once again, this really seems, really seems hard, but it is actually much different from the first two. Malice is more intending harm on somebody. Um, so an action or an attitude intending harm. Um, yeah, maybe we're like you wish the worst on somebody, right? There, there was a there was a song that came out a number of years ago. I don't remember the whole song, but I just remember uh, the the premise of the song was "I'll pray for you, I'll pray your car breaks down, and you know you have all these problems." And, and the music video was real funny because the, there's this pot flower pot from windowsill and it drops on them and stuff and all kinds of bad stuff happens their brakes stop working when they're going driving downhill and uh you know the, that would be a good example of malice uh, when you are wanting desiring intending harm on somebody and then that takes us to uh slander which is not the same as the other things it's more fo it's more focused on your mouth um the things that you say but it's more complicated than that because, um, so we could say it's a damaging statement to either God or others. Usually not true. Okay, it, it's a, 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 a slander. Slander is not always false. It's not always true. It tends to be not true, or at least a little bit skewed. Um, but either way, that that that's about the thing, and it can be about God or others. So um, let's say you get real mad because things in life just aren't going real, real, real well, and you're you're crying out to God, and you're just you're saying things about God that maybe aren't real true. You know what I mean? You don't care. You've never cared. You've never been there for me. That kind of stuff. Ever been in that place, or are you all just like you're all perfect? And <laughs> never mind. I've never done that either. And uh, then about others would be something like you know ah, that the, 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 Ray. He's just he's always. Yeah. Every time that I talk to the guy, you know, malice, or I mean, I'm sorry, I mean slander. Um, and then that separates us from the last thing, which is a little bit not really needing to be clarified. Uh, filthy language is something, that, one of those things that, I mean, it's kind of not one thing specific. It's kind of a category of things. And it's something that we don't really need somebody to tell us what it is because we, we already know, right? Um, you could say cussing is filthy language. You could say uh, going on a rant is oftentimes uh, filthy language. You know, um, sometimes we, we think that we have the answer to all the world's problem. And if people would just listen to us, boy, we'd be able to set them, set them straight. And if you don't believe me, go watch the news. Hmm? You will all have a rant about how they're stupid. You've got the answer. They just listen to you. So don't pretend like you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, another thing that filthy language could be is hate. When, when you're just talking real hateful to people. That could be filthy language. Uh, when you're talking spiteful. I've known a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians, who they can't, just can't help but say snide comments. They just can't. Every chance that they get, they just... Meh, 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 meh. All the parts in Proverbs where it says, hey, you know, a fool is instantly known because their mouth is open. You know, they just ignore those verses. And they're just like, no, you know, I, ha I mean, I had... There, there was one person, and they were convinced that 
Paul's statements about women were sexist, and so they didn't have to follow that. And so they just pick out parts of the Bible that they felt were not really God's word, and other parts are just like, yeah, that's probably okay. And that was like their whole. They never just like read the Bible to learn to be a student of be a student of God. It was all about you know I already have it figured out. Um, I remember there, there was this one person who uh, they had been divorced numerous times, and they they just couldn't help but say the, saying these little snide things. Specifically, any time that they got that they got a chance to say something snide to say something snide about men, specifically men. Um, whenever people get divorced, there's always the risk of thinking of the opposite gender as the worst thing in the world. And I mean, that goes for men and women. It's not something that only women do. Everybody does that. And uh, so this person, though, was a woman who had been divorced multiple times from men. Not that they're the only ones who do this. And uh, so she kept trying to say these side things uh, to try to get a rise out of me or, or out of this other guy. It wasn't really me. She was kind of focusing her attention on, on on him. And one thing that, that she said was she said, yeah, you got to train your husband, like trying to I don't know, talk down to her or something like that. And I was sitting there just listening, and I was kind of keeping my mouth shut. And I said, you know, if you go into a marriage trying to train the other person instead of accepting them for who they are, you're probably uh, probably not going to have a real good time in that relationship. And it's not really even possible anyways. I mean, were any of your husbands able to tame you? And, uh, well, I didn't say it in a hateful way, and I didn't say it in a snide way, but she actually, you know, stopped and kind of backed up off the other guy. And, uh, you know, my, my main concern with the church isn't that, you know, women are put in their place or that, you know, men are kept in dominance. It's more like this, um, you know, be loving towards each other. And if you don't have anything nice to say, just keep your mouth shut. I mean, I think that's a very simple concept. But evidently, we didn't all learn the same things as kids. <laughs> and the funny thing was, <laughs> I got to tell this, the same person, um, she later was going off on one of her rants and she said, yeah, they just aren't raising kids the way that they used to when I was when I was a kid and I told her this was after we had a lot of disagreements and we were kind of not really getting along real well. I told her, oh, so your parents told you to, to be a troublemaker who's always saying snide things and uh, causing problems? That's how they taught you people to do things back in your day? And uh, it didn't go over well. I probably should have kept my mouth shut. But I'm just saying is all. I'm just saying is all. Uh, another example of filthy language would be uh, being conceited. You know. Uh, I know everything. You can't teach me anything. And uh, so Don once wrote this. He said, uh, anger is such a powerful emotion. Only God can be trusted to exercise it uh, fairly. And I think that that's a pretty good statement to live by. Um, whenever you think that you have an excuse to be angry, just keep your mouth shut. Uh, I've talked about this before and in, in great length, and I'll just mention it here very quickly. Um, we like to think as Christians that there's such a thing as righteous anger. But the Bible says absolutely that our anger, our anger doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. So even if you are angry for a good reason, keep your mouth shut. Because what happens is you're going to say something stupid, do something stupid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how does, how does this little section have anything? Well, before I get to the application here, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, the main point of what we looked at tonight, conform your actions to Christ. So remember last week we were thinking about think, think holy. Now we're talking about conforming your actions to Christ. And uh, so the application that I could that I could give for tonight is something that I personally used. I always try to give you guys stuff that, that I'm learning, stuff that I'm uh, has benefited me. And, and this is one of the things that has benefited me. Before you speak, think. It's a real simple thing to remember. Before you speak, think. Think is, uh, I think it's called an acronym. Uh, so there's true, helpful, inspiring, necessary. Kind of, you see how it spells think. So when you're talking, the first thing, is it true? Well, I heard, yeah, but if you don't know that it's true, you don't know how many times, you know, when I'm training my kids, I'll oftentimes say things, say things as fact that they don't know as fact, right? Because they're kids. So I try to teach them, no, 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 you don't know that. You, don't, you can't say things you don't know. But as we get older, I'm noticing that the old, older people do it too. It's not something that just we're confined to kids. So first off, is it true? Is the thing that you're saying actually true? The same thing, is it helpful? Sometimes people say things that are true, but they're not really helpful. Um, and my dad says this thing, and see if I can remember it. He says, the difference between, how does he say it? The difference between a fact and a truth is that truth is said with love, or something like that. I don't remember exactly how it is, okay? But the idea being how you present the truth. 
right? Well, you're just a bitter, hateful person. It's true, but it's not overly helpful. And if I'm talking to people like that, they probably aren't going to listen to what I'm saying, right? Because I'm kind of talking down to them. And you know, anytime you talk down to people, I mean, even your kids, you can you know rant and rave at your kids and talk down to them, and they won't listen. You know what I mean? It's this exact same thing with adults. I'm noticing more and more why Paul gave us the example of see how they treat their kids to see if they'd be a good pastor. Because it really is something that is, it's a micro world that is shown and magnified in, in other areas of your life. Um, okay, so uh, is it helpful? Um, is it inspiring? Are you, are you encouraging the person to do better or are you just trying to tear them down? See what I mean? Uh, do you care about them? Do you care about their well-being? Even when you reprimand somebody, right? Even kids, hopefully you aren't reprimanding your spouse. Hopefully you're having a one-on-one -on -one talk. Back in the day, I used to think that um, it was a man's job to reprimand his wife. Uh, I don't really think that too much now. <laughs> I think it's more of a thing of spouses should be honest with each other and should be talking with each other. You know what I mean? And when your spouse takes the time to talk with you about something, you should be humble enough to listen. But we don't, though, do we? We make everything a battle. Well, I'm not going to give you sex for a week. You know, and we make it all a thing about this tug of war, and it really shouldn't be. It should be, you know, you should be open and honest with your spouse. I mean, that's just how it should be. Um, anyways, um, so is it, is it inspiring? The next thing, is it necessary? There's a lot of times it just because it sounded good and it was a good idea. Maybe it was a true idea. Maybe it would really help them, but maybe it's just not the right time, or maybe it just never is a good time, right? Like there's some things I was joking with my dad one time because he said that this was this was years back, but he said this kind of this kind of rude thing to somebody, and he said, "Well, I said it in a nice way," and I said, "Is there a nice way to say that?" I mean, there, there's some situations where you can say it as nice as you can, but it's still like not like, "Hey, Ray, you're you're a little bit of a jerk friend." I said it in a nice way. You see what I mean? Like it's there's no nice way to say that, and uh, so that takes us to the idea: Is it necessary? Is it something that you sh should say? Um, or is it just something that you can say? And there's a lot of th that takes us into the area of wisdom because it's not about what is wrong or right to say, it's about what is wise or foolish to say. And that takes a lot of thought. And uh, sometimes we just get we just get like real antsy and nervous. I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna let it out, and that way I just get over with it. When sometimes it's like maybe your nervousness is a sign that you should stop and think about this and maybe not even say it at all. I can't count the times that as a worship leader, as a as a pastor, as this or that, I, I thought, oh, I had to take care of this right now. And oftentimes, if you just, you don't. Oftentimes, you don't. Um, you think that it's a real, ah, big deal, and it's not. I mean, I remember there was this one time that there was this person that was going to help out this thing. And uh, this person was not qualified, and we did not want them helping with this because of their past. It was They had a violent history, and I, we were concerned about that. And uh, it just kind of had a way of working itself out in the end where, I mean, we wouldn't have let them do it anyways, but we just waited for five seconds, and the situation actually kind of resolved itself. We kind of get a little bit impatient, though, about stuff. And the last thing is it kind. And so I, I hope that this kind of helps you uh, kind of apply what we've been looking at in, in Colossians tonight. Uh, before you speak, think. 